Thank you for the, uh, the reading. Uh, have you ever seen any of these uh, uh, before and after pictures? Uh, maybe uh, it's a before and after of people or, or buildings or, or whatever. Um, I don't know if we uh, are able to uh, see one or two before and afters. Um, here we have a, a car. Uh, I think you could probably just about see it on that screen with this picture. Um, I, I picked this one. It does uh, look a little bit like it's a, it's a, a good option for a cleanup uh, in the first place. It's not too much of a rust bucket. Um, but uh, they've, they've cleaned it up, and uh, after something's happened, wow, look at the car. Now, what, what's next? Uh, a house. Now, I don't know if this is your color scheme. Um, uh, not all before and afters, um, uh, in my opinion anyway, uh, look that much better. But uh, maybe you like the after, um, but maybe you don't. Uh, but there was a before and after. Do you know this guy? Uh, a before and after. What's the significance of the dates? 2009, 2016. I, I think this is when he started and when he finished his, his terms of office uh, at the White House. Um, yeah, responsibility can age us. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, maybe a, a more typical thing, I've seen this on uh, televisions or, or ladies' magazines that uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, they always seem to do their best at making someone look kind of the ladies like this. And, and uh, clearly hasn't done her hair or done anything, uh, uh, maybe hasn't even washed that morning. But you know, just to try and emphasize the, the, the difference, I, I'm not saying that uh, she looks better in the after, I'm just saying there is a before and after. Okay, uh, and do you know this guy? <laughs> um, a before and after, a younger and an older. Um, I, I don't know if this is a before and after he was a film star or before and after he had his teeth done or what, but uh, a before and after, and I can't remember if there is another one after this. Oh, before and after. Yeah, lesson learned. Don't leave your kids at home. They might turn out really bad. Um, anyway, there is a story behind the pictures that uh, maybe some of you know. A before and after. Things can change depending on our situation, our, our circum circumstance, things that we're exposed to. Things can change. A before and after. And I, uh, I want to share with you uh, a few thoughts about what it is to be an unveiled worshipper. Just continuing in our, our series of uh, the un-something worshipper, uh, this week we have the unveiled worshipper. And you maybe have picked up in the, the scripture reading uh, something about Moses and, and a veil. Moses, when he went into the presence of God, something changed. There was a before and after Interestingly, did you see that it, it was that he didn't necessarily notice the difference. He didn't realize the difference. It was the other people when they saw Moses. They, oh. Things changed for Moses when he went into the presence of God. I want to just have a little bit of a run-up to that particular story that we had from our scripture reading. You see... Moses had, had led these people, uh, this, this nation, these Hebrews, out of Egypt. Longer story, but I'll try and cut it down. And, uh, and leading them out of Egypt, and there was this whole thing of, of what happened with, with plagues and so on. And, and when I read these stories, I think, wow, if something like that happened to me in my life, um, surely I, I would never wander away from God. And then I have to think about reality. And the things that have happened in my life and how I've been too quick and too easy to wander away. But anyway, they, they had these, these amazing things, these, these plagues and so on that happened in, in Egypt uh, and they still hadn't left, but God was looking out for them. God was providing for them. 
And then, then they go out and, and they're leaving and, and Pharaoh said, yes, leave. And, and they leave and, and then they go out and there's desert and a sea in front of them and then the ar army after them, uh, Pharaoh's changed his mind. And despite what has happened in their lives, they still look and they say, oh, Moses, grumble, 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 they were. Or was it that there weren't any graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert? But then God parted the sea and they went through and God delivered them. Well, surely that, that would be amazing. If that happened to me, you know, I, I, I wouldn't wander away from God. I, I wouldn't be distracted. And they have a big party and, and shortly after that, God calls Moses to go up a mountain to receive instruction. God says, look, I want you to bring a couple of stones because I'm going to write down something for you. Moses goes up the mountain. People are waiting down below. The mountain gets covered with a cloud. God was meeting with Moses at the top of the mountain in the cloud. And he gives Moses some instruction. But what about the people at the bottom? The people looked up at the mountain, saw the cloud, and they were afraid. They were worried. Oh, a bit too scary. So rather than follow the God that had led them out of Egypt, my Bible says they decided they wanted to make their own God, one that they could see. So they made a golden calf. And Moses comes down, having met with God, carrying his rocks. And he sees these people. He's got Joshua with him. And he says to Joshua, what's going on? And they have this conversation. Are they, are they celebrating? Are they, is this a celebration? Is it, is it, what's going on? And Moses realizes what's going on. And he throws these rocks on the ground. He's just had this instruction from God, and he wants to bring this instruction to, to God's people. Yet the people have wandered away. In fact, in, in Exodus uh, chapter 33, in the conversation that God has with Moses, uh, God says, look, I, I, I'm not going to go with you into this promised land now. I, I'll, send someone, I'll send an angel to, to lead you into the promised land. Why? God says, because these people are, I can find it again, you, you, because you are a, a stubborn and rebellious people. I've had enough with you, God's saying. After all that I've done for you, and now you want to go after a, an image that you make? Moses had been in the presence of God, brought down some instruction. And he'd thrown these rocks on the ground. He was so annoyed with these people. But God didn't give up. I'll save the time and fast forward. There's a conversation with, with God, and, uh, God and, um, and Moses, though. And uh, Moses says, look, um, I, I, would you please go with us? Because without you, we are nothing. And God kind of has this conversation and, and kind of eventually agrees, okay, I will go with you as a people because of you as a person, because of you as a leader, because you have been faithful to me, I will be faithful to these people. And then it says in uh, Exodus uh, from uh, chapter 33 still that... Uh, Moses goes in and out of a place that he sets up to meet with God. So it says that uh, Moses takes a tent and, and uh, in a very uh, pathfinder kind of way, Emery, he, he takes his tent and he takes it outside of where the camp was and sets up this tent. And this is where Moses was going to meet with God. And he goes in this tent and it says that this, this cloud, this pillar comes down and, and waits at the entrance of this tent and Moses meets with God, and God gives him some instruction. 
And it's maybe a kind of a situation where we're not used to going out to the back garden and putting up a tent and meeting with God and, and a cloud comes down. But Moses set up a place for him to meet with God. As I read through this story, I think to myself, if I want to meet with God, maybe I need to do more about setting up a place, anticipating a time to meet with God, not just in my rush, rush, hustle, bustle life, expecting God to kind of run alongside me. Moses meets with God in the tent. And as Moses goes into the tent, it says in, in Exodus 33, verse 10, that the people were, stand outside their tents, and as Moses goes in, they all bow down and worship God. Any of you that might have, have followed anything that I've been writing on, on Facebook recently on, on a daily devotional, you might have read something about uh, some reflections I've had on, on looking at this study of what it is to, to worship God. To worship God is as much about a posture, a, a way of coming before God. But they bowed down before God. And then it says, Moses, inside the tent of meeting, verse 11 of 33, chapter 33 of Exodus. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Have you ever spoken with God face to face? And what does it mean that Moses spoke with God face to face? Because if you actually look a few verses later in the next chapter or so, we have a story of, of Moses pleading with God that I want to see your presence. Hang on a minute, Moses. Haven't you seen God face to face? Moses has already been some years, many years before, seen God's presence at a bush that was burning but wasn't being consumed by the flames. So what, is, what does it mean that Moses met with God face to face and then later on Moses asks, I want to see your presence? We get a bit of a clue of this, this idiom of, of Moses being face to face with God in Numbers chapter 12, feel free, please do turn with me. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 8. In fact, uh, if I read uh, a couple of verses around it as well, it says uh, from verse 6, And the Lord said to them, Now listen to what I say. This is God speaking. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions, I would speak to them in dreams, but not with my servant Moses. For all my, ha for all my house, he is the one I trust. I speak to him face to face. Hmm. Same terminology. In one translation, it says uh, mouth to mouth. God speaking mouth to mouth with someone? That kind of sounds even more weird, doesn't it? But what does it mean? Speaking mouth to mouth, face to face, we get the explanation clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So we have Moses going in and meeting and being in the presence of God. But he doesn't see God with his eyes. But he has this conversation. And this conversation is a clear instruction from God. It's not in riddles. It's not in visions and dreams. God spoke clearly to Moses. Wow. Thanks for the explanation, Nathan. And now we have all this other stuff about the covenant and setting up the tabernacle and so on. But it's more, there's more to it than that. What happened to Moses when he spoke with God face to face? We read on 
from chapter 33 in Exodus. When he was uh, face to face, it says that uh, he came out, um, it says, take those people into the promised land. And this is where I say that they had that uh, conversation about, please, God, come with me. And then uh, as we go into uh, chapter 33, we have Moses pleading with God. about, I, I want to see your presence. Although Moses has spoken with God face to face already, continually. Moses says, I want to see your presence. So God makes this arrangement with him. He says, look, Moses, you can't see me fully. But if I meet you in a certain place, I'll, I'll hide most of my presence from you. And, and I'll say my name as I come past so that you know it's me. And then just as I've come past, then you can turn and look and see just the back of me. Because if you see me face to face, you will be consumed. I love what God calls himself. Uh, there's a whole other sermon here, really. But it says in, in chapter 34, when God comes past him, God says to Moses, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. This is the God that Moses went out and spoke with. That Moses set up a place that he could commune with God. It says in verse 8, that Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshipped. And after he'd finished doing all of this worshipping, he comes out. There's a whole lot more conversation that we, uh, we can leave to another day. But it says that as Moses came out of being in the presence of God, what does it say? That the people saw of Moses? What does it say? Verse 29 of chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, this is the second time that he's gone up, but it's repeated when he goes in to the tent to meet with God. When Moses came down from Sinai carrying two stones of tablet. Again, God has written some instructions for Moses to give to his people. God has met with Moses, giving him this instruction. Moses comes down, it says, he wasn't aware that his face, this is Moses' face, had become radiant because he had spoken to God. And then those following verses as we had read in the scripture reading. That they were afraid. The people were afraid of Moses. And Moses came to an arrangement of covering up his face. To hide the, the reflected radiance of God. Our sermon is about the unveiled worshipper though. Moses would unveil himself when he came back into the presence of God but then need to cover himself up when he saw other people why would he do that it does prompt me to think about my time of going out to meet with God I don't go out to a tent but to the place where I choose to meet with God. When I have been with God, do I unveil myself? Do I make myself totally available to God? When I meet with God and I come away from God's presence, is there a change in me? Is there a before and after? 
a good before and after. If you turn with me, just for a couple of minutes, to 2 Corinthians. Because Paul, writing to the people in Corinth, uses this analogy of, of a veil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, many of us know of, uh, of John 3.16, um, but uh, so often, strangely enough, in, in many other books, chapter 3 and verse 16 has, has a lot of strength and power. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul writes... Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The veil in Paul's story here is about a distance that we create between us and God. The, the veil isn't like a physical thing. We, we can't see the presence of God and people can't see the presence of God in us if we're not looking at God. But the moment that we turn to look at God, we turn to see Jesus. It says that the Lord takes away anything that obstructs us from him. Verse 12 of... 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We can be bold as we come before God because we don't need to wear anything, a veil. We don't need to have anything that separates us from God. But something else happens too. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and, the, and wherever the Spirit is, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's the freedom again that we talked about with the children's story. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. When we come before God, when we turn our eyes towards Jesus, Jesus takes that veil away. He takes away anything that has separated us from, from him. And then we can see the full glory of God. And if that isn't wonderful enough that we have this direct access to Jesus. We don't see him physically at the moment, but we will one day. But when that happens, do you see something happens to us? Just like it happened to Moses. Moses didn't realize that it had happened to him. He didn't realize that this radiance of God was reflecting from him. But other people saw it in him. And Paul is saying here, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. There is something happens, something that happens when we come into the presence of God. That metaphoric veil is simply our turning towards God, having been facing away. When we turn towards God, when we look at Jesus, when we see him metaphorically face to face, when we see him and listen and we, everything is clear, something help, else happens. We reflect the glory of God. As you leave this place of worship today, don't look around the room thinking, hmm, yeah, they're reflecting glory of God. Oh, no, they're not reflecting. But it's something for you to reflect on, on yourself. Have I sought to set up a place of meeting with God? And do I, 
deliberately turn my face towards God, that he may take away this veil, that we may meet and everything will become clear in my life. And having met with God, will other people see the presence of God, the glory of God, reflected in the way I live my life? The unveiled worshipper is the worshipper who turns towards God and reflects his glory.